Uh, on behalf of Wu nice. University, I would like to thank you all for uh, making this video going. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm delighted to join this superb, superb faculty to discuss the natural history of Demodex and its role in disease, particularly eyelid disease. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce our wonderful speaker, Dr. Catherine Mestroda. Uh, she is a 1989 graduate of the State University of New York College of Optometry. She was awarded the SUNY Alumna of the Year as well as the NYSOA Alumna of the Year. She is currently the Director of Optometry at the New York Hotel Trades Council Employee Benefit Executive on the Executive Board or the, of the American Board of Optometry and is the past program chair of the anterior segment section of the American Academy of Optometry. And she does it all, folks. Okay, go ahead and hear from her. Okay. All righty then. Um, I was so excited about my, um, my <laughs> presentation that I just kind of jump start. I just trying to jump started and got right into it. Um, there has been a you know recent interest in Demodex and its um, role in, in eyelid disease and skin disease of the past 10 to five to 10 years. But in, in honesty, mites of the genus Demodex and Demodex are little mites were described as parasites of hair follicles and sebaceous glands in man over 180 years ago. And uh, Demodex in fact, are the most common obligatory human ectoparasites. There are two um, that we are particularly interested in, a Demodex folliculorum, which is the longer of the mite, and Demodex brevis, which is its cousin and smaller. Folliculorum tend to nestle in hair follicles, that's of the eyelashes or hair anywhere on the body, armpits, pubis, in the ears, and brevis, which tend to reside in sebaceous and or oil glands. And these would be the oil glands that service the hair, the skin, or of course, meibomian glands. I'd like to uh, show you an, uh, the cover page of an excellent 1919 monograph that was put out by the British History, uh, the British Museum of Natural History. And what you can see here is that in the genus of Demodex, there are many, many species, and in fact, over 140 have been identified. And each of these species is specific to the host that it um, becomes a parasite of. So you can have a Demodex genus of species for the horse, cattle, dogs, pig, pigs, pigs, goats, mice, and although um, they all are different, they are all the same in that they have a segmented body. And I think of it as head, torso, and tail. And they have these eight little legs. What we may be familiar with is Demodex canis, the, the species of Demodex that uh, infests dogs and causes mange, causes hair falling out, mites, um, redness and hair loss in the dog. And we have mites that do similar th things to the other mammals. And if I look over here to the left, we see Demonex cavi, which is a Demonex of a guinea pig in comparison to the folliculorin of its human host. So we have Demodex mange in dogs. How, how, how does this impact humans? Well, Mites have been associated, Demodex mites, with rosacea and with blepharitis. And this slide, courtesy of Sheffer Sang in Florida, who's done a lot of work with rosacea and Demodex, uh, shows us a patient with skin rosacea. Here on the right, we have ocular rosacea and, um, and blepharitis. And I bring draw your attention to the spiky little de debris on the lid margin. So Demodex is linked to rosacea, ocular rosacea, and blepharitis. Rosacea and blepharitis um, is very complex. The pathophysiology has many, many layers. And Demodex is probably only one facet of, of the change or the in, in involvement in patients who develop rosacea. And we 
think this because demodex generally can live on the skin as a harmless commensal organism, or it can be pathogenic. And it's very difficult to understand what triggers this change. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But we understand that it's clinical or molecular host immunological interactions with the mites that are happening that we really don't understand. So we've seen a picture in, in our previous presentation of, of acne rosacea. As eye doctors, we should know that ocular disease, ocular rosacea, precedes the cutaneous manifestations in about 20% of the cases. So we'll see this first. Uh, however, patients who do have uh, obvious rosacea, and this patient has the rhinophyma, the natophyma of the chin, you can get similar changes on the cheek, the forehead, and the ears. These patients, more than half of them, will go on to develop ocular rosacea. Well, here we can see the obvious changes related to ocular rosacea, comparing a normal lid margin to patients with ocular rosacea. Rosacea, and there's a, a lot to to talk about here uh, on this slide. In the normal slide, we see this nice, pale, uninflamed, sharp edge margin of the lower lid of this patient. We have clear lashes in a nice row. And I'm sorry, we have the fire department driving by. And on the right, we have a patient with ocular rosacea. You have these almost angry looking abnormal filigree type vessels that have invaded the, the lid margin. You have debris on the lashes. You have a watery TR film related to the loss of surface tension because there's changes in the meibomian gland oils which hold that tear film tight to the eye. You have undulations and changes. You have compromise of the edges of the, of the lid margins that comes from chronic uh, lid margin disease or ocularization. So the changes here are obvious. Now, what we mentioned briefly, you know, demodex are not the one and only precipitata of ocular rosacea or rosacea. However, in the literature, you'll find that there's a statistical association between demodex mite density and rosacea and facial itching and chronic blepharitis. But why is this? Why is this? Are there mites that are more virulent than others? Is it uh, a situation like uh, we see in, in bacteria with quorum sensing and changes in gene expression? Is it something changing in the mite? Is it something changing in what's related to the specific mite? That is the bacteria that the mites host themselves. Does that wax and wanes and change? Is it purely because of the particular mite and its particular human host? Do they have a certain interaction that allows the mite to become a, a pathologic organism? Or is it something between the mites and the human and or the mites and the environment that they're in? And so with a changing environment, you have a changing uh, attitude, so to speak, of the demodex and what they do. So question upon question, the more we learn, the more we don't know. One of the things that interests me is floppy eyelid syndrome. And lo and behold, uh, floppy eyelid syndrome is associated with demodex brevis. So uh, in, uh, in floppy eyelid syndrome, just a quick uh, review, you get floppy, rubbery, and easily averted upper eyelids. And here, this patient, I just said, hey, let me, let me check your lid. And I just reached over and it flipped. It need anything to do it, flip right over. You'll get highlid, eyelid, excuse me, hyperpigmentation. And you can see that going on in this patient here and a little bit over here. You get lid ptosis and lash ptosis. You can have dermatoclasis, you have papillary conjunctivitis. And this is often what brings these patients in. You have chronic red eye, chronic discharge. You have lacrimal gland prolapse squamous metaplasia and keratinization of the meibomian glands. And what does that lead to? Meibomian gland dysfunction and diminished lipid production. So they'll have those dry eye complaints that we just heard about. And important, of course, is the association with floppy eyelid syndrome with sleep 
obstructive sleep apnea. And this is a very important conversation to have with your patients. And interestingly, this patient right here with the floppy eyelid syndrome also has papopustular rosacea. So we might have the folliculorum in the skin and the brevis doing something in the eye. It's a cornucopia of, of fun. This patient is about two decades younger than the patient that we saw in the previous image. And if you could see here, he has a definite eyelash ptosis. When you look at him, you see it right here on this right eye. And if we go a little bit larger, a little bit closer up, the eyelid, he has floppy eyelid syndrome. He has definitive lash ptosis. I also draw your attention to some of the debris that he has here along the lid margin, and also a little bit in the eyebrow. Remember, a follicular mites like any hair. Maybe it's an eyelash hair, maybe it's an eyebrow hair, maybe it's a nose hair or ear hair. They make their home in hair. Looking at the mite itself, um, you know, we have its biologic classification here. Of course, we are talking about right now the genus Demonex and the species Folliculorum and Brevis. This is an electron microscopic image of a folliculorum. It is a little flat and balloony looking. This is, a, of course, a post-mortem image of the mite. And in real life, when you look at them and in light microscopy of one perhaps epilated from a patient, they aren't quite this balloony. They are much more compact and flat and translucent. They have, this happens to be a follicularum. They have annular ling, rings, pardon me, along their cigar-shaped tail. Again, I consider three segments, head, torso, and tail. They have eight little legs with some claws, and they are covered by a chitinous exoskeleton. So because they're semi-translucent, Oh, the, their inner structures are exposed to the oxidizing effects of light. And perhaps this is why, you know, we find them nestled in the dark, in the glands, uh, in the eyelash follicles, because light is not such a comfortable thing for them. You can see some of the contents of the body uh, right here in the tail. Looking at them in more detail, we're back to our electron microscopic poofy image. Uh, Demodex folliculorum, the longer of the two, is only a third of a millimeter long. So Demodex folliculorum, the mites are very small and can only see under magnification, not to be confused with other ectoparasites of the lids, lids for example, um, a, a louse. Uh, they're very, very tiny, and Demodex brevis, the short of the, the sebaceous oil gland uh, cousin, is even half the size of the folliculorum. As I mentioned, they have eight legs, and each leg has, has six or so claws. They locomote, they can move uh, eight to 16 millimeters an hour. And although literature just states that they may come out and roam around at night, not totally convinced of that, but certainly it can happen. Uh, the cigar-shaped tail, and there also is a male and female of the species. One other thing to notice right here, a little bit hard to see, is that they have little spurs. So they have claws and spurs, and uh, the, this helps in locomotion, but also helps them to anchor in the site that they finally um, deliver to. The mite mouth parts are quite sophisticated for a guy or gal who's so little. It's a, a complex mouth with feeding claws, again, claws to anchor and to move to get where they need to go. An oral opening with a sharp oral needle, that's right about here, that is thought to pierce cells to either extract cytoplasm or to feed on sebum or keratin, or perhaps even the bacteria that are on um, the host that they, that they reside on. 
Back to our wonderful 1919 monograph, we have a line and pencil drawing of the, the mouth parts. And on the top is a top view of the, the head and the bottom view of the tail. And here you see the oral needle and the palpal claws. Again, claws, tines, spurs. They also have the spurs on the top of their head. So you know, they're really built for um, boring and burrowing into the glands that um, they are, that are their favorite. What's interesting to appreciate is that the mite has a digestive pouch. So um, there is no terminal excretory opening, which means that material foods that uh, enter through the oral needle uh, are digested, but there is no exit. So it's probable that digested remains are regurgitated. And these will contain some lipases and proteases that can incite an inflammatory reaction in the host. So what goes in one way goes out the same way. In that gut material, as noted before, the Demodex have their own uh, flora, uh, either on the mite itself or in their gut. Same thing, you know, like it's host, we, people, humans, we have flora on our ocular surface, on our skin, and in our gut, and so do uh, Demodex mites. Um, it has been demonstrated that patients who have been diagnosed with Demodex blepharitis have varying degrees of bacterial microbiota imbalance in the conjunctival sac. You know, speaking to Demodex serving as a vector, you know, bringing in its own, uh, you know, microbial uh, bioflora. And, and here we understand that a, a, a role for liver hygiene is important, not only for removing pollens and makeup and, and everything that we put in and on our, and our lids, but to remove some of the elements that Demodex bring to us, including uh, the, the Demodex themselves that are exposed. Now, um, many of you may be thinking, phew, I'm glad I don't have those Demodex things, you know, on my lids and lashes. But uh, if we want to be fair to ourselves, we all probably do, uh, because Demodex populations are age dependent, they increase with age, and in our elderly patients, we can probably find or isolate Demodex mites in, in probably all of our, of our elderly patients. Uh, remembering uh, the folliculorum, the longer is in hair and eyelash follicles, and the uh, brevis are in sebaceous glands. And that includes um, you know, the meibomian glands for, for our purposes, the zeiss glands, and even the sebaceous glands, the mole. And if we take a look at a nice line and pencil drawing of our lid margin, you know, we have the cilium, the lash here is where our demodex folliculorum friends are generally found, and the brevis in mole. Enzymes. Of course, the other juiciest oil gland are the meibomian glands, and we will get um, host Demodex brevis here. Now, you want to think about it. You know, what, what do a boatload of Demodex mites in the, the hair follicle you know, want you to do for us? Well, the Demodex will nestle head down into the lash follicle. And they will go deeper and deeper. And even from this image of this um, hair, which hap is not an eyelash. Why? How do we know that? Because there's an erective chelae. And our eyelashes, although the follicle looks pretty much like this, there's no erective chelae. Uh, but we, we do have the lash bulb. We have the gland that services the eyelash fiber. And you can just appreciate the depth of this follicle uh, and the only little bit of hair that's on the surface. And anybody who's pulled a hair from their, their chin or their cheek or their eyebrow knows that the follicle is very deep. The important site of the hair follicle is the bulge. And this is a, a, a stem cell niche. And it's important for wound healing. So, you know, our eyelashes and hair, not only do they make us beautiful and for protection and 
all the other reasons why we have uh, bodily hair, but the stem cell niche of the hair is important to wound healing. So in, infestation, or what I rather prefer to say overpopulation of demodex mites in the, the hair follicle do interfere with uh, the normal cycling of, of, of the lashes or of hairs. And here is a, a photograph of three mites. Here are their tails buried head down into a lash follicle. Here's the hair. You can see the cuticle of it, their tail ends showing. And up to 25 mites have been counted in a follicle. Then I, I can almost say there probably are more. We really don't have an answer. You know, what, what is, how do we say somebody has a demodex overpopulation. You know, is it five mice in a follicle, 10, 20, 30, 50? There really is no consensus. I think one of my favorite, favorite pictures of Demodex and how I think of them is even earlier than our 1919 monograph. It is our 1915 a monograph. And here we can see our um, mite I'm not sure this is a folliculorum with the longer tail and its segmented bodies. Very nice uh, depiction of the head and mouth parts and that spur that almost looks like a hook for some hooking action into the follicle, deeper and deeper, burrowing, burrowing, boring and drilling into the hair follicle. And many, many mites stacked layer upon layer, deeper and deeper into this, here's the hair into this hair follicle. Uh, just making their way deeper into that follicle. So you have one to how many nose, how many mites, um, you know, sardine canned into a hair follicle with their mites and their claws and their hooks, uh, breeding and feeding. And this certainly you can imagine the, the havoc that this can um, create on a, on, a, on, a, on a niche, on a cycling hair. Uh, it interrupts the tissue integrity. And we know how important tissue integrity is for protection to the elements, to protection from bacteria. Um, and you know, the mites in, this, uh, fol in these follicles causes edema of the follicle, inflammation, distension, hypertrophy, plugging of the lash follicle. You get epithelial hypoplasia of the follicle, which is cuff, which creates cuffing debris that is uh, built up and extruded along the base of the lash, serv um, excuse me, the lash uh, surface. That they're like sleeves. It's uh, it's uh, referred to sometimes and often as cylindrical dandruff formation. This truly um, is the hallmark, a patho considered pathognomonic of uh, demodex overpopulation. And this cuffing, this cylindrical bandra is, um, it's, it's, it's composed, it's a melange, it's a mortar of uh, skin cells from the host, uh, oils, uh, demodex eggs, which we'll get into, of the digestive, that is the regurgitated excretions of the mites, and of decomposed and dead mites, as un unappealing as that sounds. And it creates uh, this spiny, pokey type blepharitis, a pinchy blepharitis. You know, it's a little bit different than the flat sort of blepharitis that we may see in seborrheic or uh, bacterial related blepharitis. And certainly we haven't mentioned it, but you know, brevis in the meibomian glands are triggers for granulomas. And just uh, a couple of months ago, there was a paper on the high prevalence of pediatric uh, chalasia associated with uh, demodex and meibomian gland dysfunction. And just today, just today, as I was preparing for this presentation, we there was a. Um, I got pinged with another study about IPL uh, as safe and effective to moderate and severe pediatric blepharitis and uh, in my bone, in, in, pardon me, and in Demodex. So there is a lot of uh, work and banter surrounding this. So when you think about your pediatric patients, 
even though Demodex populations uh, increase with age, you know, our littlest patients have them. Here is a slit lamp uh, uh, image. This is at magnification 40 of those cylindrical cuffs, uh, that um, dandruff, cylindrical dandruff, and it has a either conical or almost a volcanic look as, it, as the lash grows and this attached debris to the lid margin, as the lash grows, it will pull and peak the edge of the eyelash mar margin, but the lashes themselves are, become compromised. They are epilated much easier than would be normal because their anchor, the, the bulb is, is boggy and edematous. They have no, no good anchor, so they're easier to epilate. They can fall out. The lashes become brittle. They become depigmented. They're not dark and luxurious the way you know, we like them to be. They're shorter and they're straighter. They, they, they miss that, they're, they're missing that natural curl that you would see in uh, normal eyelashes. Their growth becomes misdirected and, and therefore you can have trichiasis. So, you know, there's a lot of things with, you know, with the lash follicle that's, that's compromised. You know, a lot of bad things can happen to your eyelashes. We spoke a little bit about the melange of debris that is the, the cuff, the, the, the hallmark sign of Demodex overpopulation. We spoke about you know, Demodex eggs being in the mix of that. And as I noted before, there are a male and female of the Demodex mite. And uh, taking a look at these two pictures, I think you can identify who is who. So, um, in their process of making more and procreating, uh, it is thought that copulation of the male and female occurs at the mouth of the hail follicle. But intuitive to me, I think it probably also happens within the hair follicle. I can't find this in a reference to you, but if you imagine the boys and the girls and they're very close together in a very tight follicle, I can imagine it's something that, that can happen not only at the mouth of the follicle, but also within the follicle, which is where the female will lay her eggs. Uh, some people say you can see them on the lashes. I, I, I find that very hard. I've seen some Demodex eggs, not a lot. Uh, I, I think that's the exception rather than the rule. And Demodex live for two to three weeks with 120 adult hours. Their life cycle, we have copulation, male and female. We have egg deposition, either on the lashes or within the follicle or gland, depending on where, where they are. And uh, like frogs, sort of, um, you know, the eggs uh, morph through a larvae and a nymph, a protonymph and a nymph, until they reach their adult configuration, male and female. The, the young Demodex mites only have six legs and they will grow their last set of legs as an adult, at which point, you know, they locomote, feed, excrete, breed, and, and you know, do their Demodex thing. From another uh, microscopic study, I, I really like this picture. Uh, we appreciate that as the eggs go through their nymph cycle to adult, that the Demodex will molt, sort of like a snake, and um, you know, discard their chitinous exoskeleton of youth. And here you see a nymph, maybe next to its older brother or sister, or maybe from another uh, litter of the mites and the moles that are surrounding the Demodex organisms, the nymph with the long skinny or snake-like tail, the older Demodex may be getting its uh, last set of legs right here, and the moles made of chitin, you know, this, the, mo the, the chitin itself and the moles themselves may excite an immunological response from the host. You know, are we allergic to the chitin? Is a specific patient allergic to the chitin? Antigens on the chitin that, that um, become irritating and inflammatory. Uh, all, all more questions.
Again, we have uh, the Demodex life cycle. Uh, here it's nice because we see from ovum to adult, the longer follicularum, the male and the female also having a different length, and the Demodex brevis, the male and the female having a different length. So if you know how to look at Demodex, you sort of know, do I have a boy? Do I have a girl? Do I have a brevis? Do I have a follicularum? You know, where do they find them? You know, what, what's their story? At the end of their two to three week life, Demodex will die. And there is banter that the females will die after egg delivery. Not so clear on that. There is banter that the males will die after copulation, not too clear on that. But either way, they will die and the necrotic material, material will contribute to the debris that's evident in clinical examination um, you know, on the slit lamp. How do we know that patients are having a problem with Demodex? But like dry eye, it, it's sometimes hard to to decide. Uh, patients who have the most Demodex, generally older, may not have any complaints. And you have to wonder is because they're not sensitive enough, is something changed. And patients with very little Demodex may be the ones that we're starting to think, well, maybe this is your problem. The patient may complain of eyelid inching, but you know, the cylindrical dandruff are, are probably something that should clue you in. And um, here we can see the more, um, cylindrical dandruff, here the more conical uh, type dandruff. But this is at the slit lamp uh, with higher magnification. You can also epilate a lash and take a look and see if you can find the Demodex. Much easier to find folliculorum, uh, harder to find brevis since they're usually uh, in the oil glands. I've expressed glands and still not found any. So it's a little bit trickier. At 40x, at 40x, so here uh, is a slit lamp image of here are the eyelashes here. And here are about one, two, three, seven uh, tails of folliculorum nestled down into the lash. And you can see how deep that, this is only the surface, but yet this much is under the skin. I draw your attention to some of the debris here. These may or may not be eggs, I'm not so sure and the waxy, shiny appearance of the lid margin. Is the lid margin waxy and shiny because the patient has Demodex, or is the waxy uh, lid margin uh, 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 a host to Demodex? Does it make it luscious for Demodex to move in? Not sure, it's a chicken and egg kind of thing. Here, again, at a 40X magnification is an eyelash lash follicle that's lost its lash but the Demodex still remain. And you can see sort of the distension of the follicle, the paleness, the bogginess of it. So this is an unhappy, unhappy follicle. And of my clinical, clinical images, this is probably one of my favorites. This is the, the trifecta of um, diagnosing Demodex. We have a mybomian uh, gland, infection slash inflammation, you know, uh, hordeolum right here. We have debris along the lid margins. We have an empty lash follicle. We have a waxy lid margin and we have a lost lash, maybe this one, not so sure, with this little fellow, you know, hanging out here. We also have, you look, these boggy meibomian gland orifices. So did the patient have meibomian gland dysfunction, that demodex, or demodex, then meibomian gland dysfunction? Or is it, you know, it's just, you know, one um, multi-layer uh, skin con condition and, and uh, blepharitis issue. So here is a little fella hanging on the lash. You can see his eight little legs. Again, this is at uh, even higher magnification if your slit lamp has it. So it's, you don't need the, the light microscope. You can do it uh, with what you have. You can visualize and isolate and identify Demodex in your office uh, by, by looking for uh, the telltale signs. Now, sometimes there's a lot of debris and it, it may be in the spectrum of the amount of Demodex or the amount of blepharitis that the Demodex is 
uh, creating or sometimes sort of like non-obvious MGD, you have not so obvious Demodex or maybe Demodex that aren't you know, giving a patient a lot of trouble. And you can actually coax these out. So if, if you look at um, this lid margin, and again, looks very waxy, looks wet, it, it looks oily. You see sort of like some conical stuff building up here along the, the lash, uh, along the base of the lash. You can see this lash has a not so normal looking neighbor here. Well, you know, what's up with that? It should be one lash per follicle, you know, something going on in the, in the niche. But if you take this lash that you're curious about and you rotate it within its follicle, like if you're a cook, a scraping a cookie dough out of uh, the mixing bowl, you can actually coax these little mites out. And the more you turn, the more you will um, cause to reach the surface. And again, here's the, you know, the skin where the mites are, but you can see even, um, you know, how deep this lash goes. And, and this is, you know, just the very tip because now it's into the, to the epidermis. Another way um, is uh, just adding a little bit of traction, maybe not even rotating. You can, you, can just, you can just pull, just pull on the lash. And as you pull the elastic nature of the follicle and the lash, the tail ends will erupt from the surface. Once you release the traction on the lash, all of this will retract back in and you will be back to, I don't see any, I don't see any mites. But again, you're thinking about maybe they're there. Look at this lash's neighbors, and here's the cylindrical bands up here and here, and you know the, some stuff going on here. So think about it. You know, tug on a couple of lashes and see see what happens when you get back to the office tomorrow. Again, from Sheffer Sang, who really, you know, contributed a lot to Demodex, Demodex and disease, and what we do know about Demodex and how to isolate them. Uh, here's a, a, you know, epilating a lash, or just, you know, yanking it out of its uh, root and putting it under a light microscope. Here are folliculorum. This would be the end of the lash. This is where the bulb of the lash would be. You see uh, Demodex, all his friends and neighbors, uh, lash uh, heads down into the follicle, which would be in the direction. Again, you see how they are laying one on top of the other. You know, um, you can understand how I would think that, you know, mating activity occurs, you know, within the follicle, not only at the orifice. We have folliculorum, the longer one, brevis, the shorter one. And this is under light microscopy of an epilated lash. Uh, you lose some of the organisms as it, they, they do get stripped from the lash as you uh, remove it from the follicle. So I just like to just stay at the slit lamp because I don't like dropping when you go along. In any event, if you find one, uh, this is what I think about. Uh, you find one, just the little tips of their tails there, all its brethren are uh, nestled deep below it. Uh, this is, uh, uh, probably skin, probably not the eyelash margin. But uh, if you see one like mice in your attic, you probably have uh, a whole uh, nest. I'm not sure if nest is the right word, but you have more. If you are lucky enough to have a confocal laser scope microscope, you can identify Demodex uh, that way. Uh, we don't. And, you know, as a reminder that even though we don't think we have them, we probably do. And the older we are, the more likely we are to find them. And uh, this, this slide I like because it calls the cylindrical dandruff, the tight-knit exuvi. So if someone says, oh, do they have cylindrical dandruff? I say, yes, they do have a exuvi. Uh, so there's a lot of names for the spray that collects along the last margins. But again, that's hallmark a pathognomonic have patients and you can see it. We spoke a little bit about uh, Demodex and the functional compromise uh, that they create in the lash margin and in the oil glands, that is chalasia uh, formation, lash loss. But 
We also know that Demodex mites can in, induce um, an uptick in tear cytokine levels, specifically I-17. So that's going to create some ocular surface inflammation. And, you know, this is, you know, probably why patients can report some discomfort. They have inflammatory molecules, you know, bathing their ocular surface. In more advanced chronic and um, prolonged demodex overpopulation, you can get a demodex blepharokeratitis. That is, you know, the cornea becomes involved because of chronic inflammation from the mite itself, from its chitin, from its related bacteria, from uh, inflammatory molecules, from just inflammation of the, the lid itself. And this chronic um, inflammation, and we heard a, a lot about this today from our different speakers, can create a, an SPK, peripheral neurovascularization, infiltrates, um, you know, ultimately corneal scars or opacities, you know, flectenular lesions, limbitis. It's, it's very reminiscent of of uh, blef, blef hypersensitivity. So, you know, anything that's uh, out of balance, and we've heard this homeostasis balance, you know, creates issues. And, you know, if you think about just, you know, the, the floor of a gut, it, it's there all the time, but once it's out of whack, you know, we, the, the fallout is appreciated. Demodex upregulates MMPs that are involved in inflammation, collagen lysis, and angiogenesis. So if you have collagen lysis and, and um, uh, rearrangement, but does this contribute to the lid laxity that we see in actropion and in our, our floppy eyelid syndrome patients that we saw earlier in the, in the lecture? Again, is it just a chitin thing that, that um, you know, promotes inflammation? And, last, and lastly, you know, we spoke about the regurgitative material that uh, mites will, uh, the digested material that contain lipases. And that what, what do they do? They produce free fatty acids from sebum triglycerides. And we've heard this before with MGD and the, the foamy tear film. So, you know, everything relates to everything else. There's poor correlation between symptoms experienced by patients and objective signs indicating demodex overpopulation. What does this sound like? It sounds like dry eye. Signs and symptoms don't agree. Uh, so there's, there's truly a lot to think about in dry eye and ocular surface disease and either in this, this little layer of um, the presence or overpopulation of, of the demodex mite. There are associated triggers that may allow for demodex overpopulation. Again, it's a chicken and egg thing. Age we discussed, which relates to hormonal status. The patient will reduce post immunity, will have um, you know, not protection for the demodex mites to kind of have the upper hand when it's associated with essential fatty acid deficiency, diabetes, certain HOA haplotypes, Down syndrome, vitamin D deficiency, poor sleep, psychological stress, and chemical pollution. Remember we talked about, is it just the mite in the particular environment on the host that it's in that really makes them um, uh, create havoc? So we're back again. And for those of you who are in Dr. Island's doctor, we're back about, we're back again with balance. Uh, the aim of treatment uh, for a patient who you believe has demodex overpopulation is balance to ensure the external ocular environment balance, to return the, the amount of Demodex um, population to balance, right? Because we know they're there, we just have to live in harmony with them. Uh, so it really is a discussion, a conversation of wellness uh, that we have to have with our patient. You know, is it your diet? Is it your diabetes? Is it, you know, your sleep, like the stress or all these things, it's, it's all about, balance. And that we, we know, we know, we've heard uh, today earlier that, you know, an imbalance caused by oculus surface conditions, be it dry eye, aqueous deficient, or meibomian gland dysfunction can lead to contact lens discomfort. Or the contact lens can induce, can be the trigger for a contact lens induced dry eye. It's probably not the lens itself. It's probably that everything that went before that, that contact lens that got uh, put on the eye. 
So a couple of different studies uh, briefly is that in uh, one study, 92, almost 93% of the patients who were intolerant of their contact lenses also had demodex. I can believe that because as I said, most of us have demodex, but you know, this is with the association that these uh, uh, authors drew that you know, the demodex was a potential cause, the abandonment of their, their soft contact lenses. I can believe it. Uh, another Arvo poster recently uh, showed us that 64% of patients who were really tagged with a demodex blepharitis diagnosis reported frequent discomfort while wearing their contact lenses. So it behooves us to you know, think about demodex um, you know, giving our patients some problems to you know, make them better contact lens wearers. Uh, it just, you, it will enhance quality of life, uh, aesthetics, uh, lots of things. I think the core of treatment for demodicosis or an overpopulation of demodex really starts with uh, lid hygiene. And there are many uh, commercially prepared solutions that can be helpful in removing the cuffs, as I say, the melange of debris. That's, it's, real, it's not so easy to get off, honestly, and having a product to um, remove them, either with surfacting it in it, not only removes the, the, the cuffs, but the associated allergens and uh, bacteria that's related to those cuffs, any exposed mites that are there, and any of the bacteria that they may bring in with, you know, bring in with them, because we have our own, and um, the mites will bring theirs. Bland ointments have been tried to suffocate the mite mites in the past, but remember they're different than the macroscopic mites with, that this can work for. Uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy to, um, to kill a demodex mite. I, you know, I know that um, lots of things have been tried on a, a mite that has been removed from its niche and you know, tried under the microscope. Not so easy to, to get them to die, honestly. Um, there are lots of operations that you can see online, either in the U.S. or elsewhere, that are touted to um, help with demodex uh, management. We do know that tea tree oil, uh, that, that, that preparations con containing tea tree oil, scrubs, shampoos are effective in reducing mite populations. We have seen this, there are clinical studies to support this. Um, however, the tea tree oil can create some irritation, a, a contact dermatitis, an allergy, and you know, it's particularly important if there's something you're using chronically to monitor this for your patient. Uh, antiparasitics have been used with some uh, uh, success, either topically or orally. Lid hygiene works. Uh, this was actually for a dry eye lecture. This is untouched photos of pre and post uh, lid hygiene. The debris is gone. The amount of uh, redness is, is uh, less. The conjunctiva looks brighter and clearer. So I am a big proponent of lid hygiene. From Scott Schachter, uh, I have this nice uh, paired uh, pre and post uh, tea tree oil treatment. This was in office for for the patient. And if you can see what I mean here by this spiny, spiky type lepharitis, where there's a little pinching along the end margins, that um, the lid margin, the lash line. Um, and then after the tea tree oil treatments, the more regular and smooth and normal contour of this patient's eyelid. So, so it does work uh, to help patients. Keep in mind, however, that terpenol 4 in vitro, even at levels tenfold to a hundredfold lower than that, which will kill a demodex mite, is toxic to human meibomian, meibomian gland epithelial cells. This is in vitro. And although we really can't make that jump to in vivo, it's something to keep in mind. Debulking with microblepharo exfoliation can be helpful. And uh, a 422 just this year paper demonstrates that 
the debulking with micro exfoliation in office makes subsequent uh, hygiene more effective, particularly with tea tree oil in the study. And there are at home gizmos that uh, you can dispense to your patient or they can find to actually brush the, uh, the lash margin here and this one more with the lid. So that's you know, something that you can offer to your patients. IPL is uh, another way that Demonex populations can be managed. IPL modulates the secretion of pro and, pro and anti inflammatory enzymes, molecules, pardon me, suppress MMPs, it reduces intracellular oxidative stress. So uh, that's very important with reactive oxygen species. It shrinks abnormal blood vessels. It, it warms and liquefies the libum so that that can be expressed subsequently or just with you know, lid hygiene. It reduces epithelial turnover and gland obstruction. And the photomodulation activates fibroblasts, increasing collagen synthesis. So you can ask, you know, if you have better collagen, will you have a better tone and texture to the eyelid margins, uh, helping if even nuanced amount for um, lid laxity and floppy eyelid syndrome. However, for the purpose of this conversation, IPL kills Demodex. Demodex, the exoskeletal, the chitin, contains a chromophore that absorbs IPL energy. And histologically, we can see that IPL induces coagulation and necrosis of Demodex. So that's another route. Uh, very natural, we have practitioners who are using Manuka honey uh, applied to the eyelid margins. Uh, I haven't tried this, but we have practitioners who uh, like to use it and patients who you know, want a, a, a more natural kind of treatment. Manuka honey is a wonderful thing that bees make it. It's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. It's known and demonstrated uh, to be therapeutic in burn and trauma therapy, anti-cancer um, uh, murmurings, it stabilizes blood sugar, used to treat GI problems, uh, reduces cholesterol, used in skin and acne, eczema, itch, and as a moisturizer. So it does it all. As we wrap up, I know we've uh, run a little bit over. Uh, oh my goodness! In the excuse me, in the pipeline, there is a new drug to treat Demodex blepharitis, and it kills the Demodex mites, which is uh, something that has been uh, difficult to do in the past, and hence it reduces the cholerate formation. This is in a phase, currently in phase three, getting very, very close, hopefully, to uh, FDA uh, authorization. It's lodolanor. The molecule is lodolanor and it's been used in veterinary medicine. We talked about Demodex canis and Demodex mange. And it acts selectively on mite neurotransmitters. So it really uh, causes them to die. And the proposed uh, duration of therapy would be for six weeks, twice a day. And in its clinical trials, it's been shown to be well tolerated and reduce Demodex populations and their associated cholerats. Uh, here is uh, a slide from one of the clinical trials. And on the top, we have some pretreatment uh, with the, before the medication. And you could see, again, the spiny, spiky type blepharitis. Uh, there was a cl a clinical endpoints included complete cholerate cure that was going from what was graded as grade four cholerates to grade zero, or clinically meaningful cholerate cure, that, you know, and then you translate that into the mite is dead, uh, where we have a grade four to a grade one or a grade two to a grade one. And what I think is most exciting, you know, for patients, not only the clinician, is a, a reduction in the redness along the lid margin. The very beginning, we looked at the very hyperemic ocular rosacea, uh, red eye, and you can see from grade two, greater than grade two to grade one, looks you know clearer and sharper, sharper and healthier. So as we wrap up, um, you know, symptomatic demodex uh, overpopulation is an imbalance. My mom used to teach grade school science, and she used to say that. Um, 
a population of, of, any, of, of anything is pollution. Pollution is an overpopulation of anything that is normal. So this is something that we're targeting to, to bring our patient back to balance. We spent the whole time thinking about, you know, how are we going to knock off the Demodex? But you have to consider, are they there for a purpose? Do Demodex, do they serve a role for us that we're not thinking about? Does the, does the, the mites that, that belong to us, the, you know, species folliculorum and brevis, it, do they play a role in protecting us uh, against, you know, against overpopulation of the, of the bacteria that are harmful to us? Do they defend us against other mite species that belong to other mammals? Do they, are they a buffer? Are they, do they regulate something or do they simply, you know, clean our follicles and keep those stem cell niches happy? Don't know, don't know. So to some, uh, and I'm gonna just read it here, although their pathogenic potential remains unclear, uh, the ubiquitous pilosebaceous mite, Demodex, generally considered a saprophyte. Overpopulation should be considered as a cause of recalcitrant cases of blepharitis, conjunctivitis, and corneal pathology. And life in general is a continuous interaction between organisms, be it your, your spouse, your child, or your Demodex. I thank you all for joining me. I don't think I showed up on the video. And I apologize for that, although I, I have all my controls so I should be there, but I'm really not. I look the same as I did 30 years ago, just as a few years ago. I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions. I know we wanna, wanna keep us in a, in a, on time for folks who have to leave, so I am here. Thank you all. Great, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Um, one of our members said it was, the best lecture on Demodex that they have ever attended. And I, I think everyone can agree.